Don't you know, last year was one of the worst years of drought. Matter of fact, it said about 60% of America, this time around summertime, end of summer, or more, was in a drought. But don't you know, we are literally in a spiritual drought. Satan has created all types of diversions for us not to grow spiritually. It appears like the Christian world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It appears like when you look into our churches, it appears that they have become spiritually degenerated. They look like a field of corn that had no water. But let me tell you, God has a people. God has a movement in these last days that he will pour out his spirit. And there will be a wonderful harvest. And that day is coming. I just want to put that in your mind now because we're going to be talking about Pentecost. And many times we hear the word Pentecost, we think about the New Testament time, right? You think about the time when the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and others that were in the upper room. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they were able to speak in tongues and other languages and other words to hundreds and hundreds of different people. God gave them supernatural power to spread the gospel. We're, we're familiar with Pentecost. But do we understand what the type and what the anti-type means? Do we understand that Pentecost was actually a festival? It was a festival. But let me ask you a question even now. Do you want to receive this rain? How important is rain? Without it, we will die. Without it, we, will, we wouldn't have our vegetation. We need rain because rain is the water. The water that, that, that revives us, revives us the water. But how does Pentecost fit into the sanctuary? Matter of fact, it's part of one of the services that was part of the sanctuary message. So before we deep, dig deep into the word of God, let us pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for all you've done. We ask you, Lord, that you would continue to lead and guide and direct us. We pray, Lord, to give us clear understanding about the sanctuary message, in particular the Pentecost, Lord. Let's learn what it is, Lord, and teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we already know, where is victory? Where can you find victory? In the sanctuary, right. Oh, thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary, who is great, our God is our God. Psalm 77, 13. We've seen many times there's victory in a sanctuary. Which, what are we trying to win victory over? What are we trying to win victory over? Sin. The pathway to God's throne. We've been, we've turned, learned a lot about God's sanctuary. Now, we understand that there were festivals that relate to the sanctuary that teach us the message of salvation. That's what we've been learning so far for the past several weeks. We've been learning more about the message of salvation. God has given us a sanctuary, plus he's given us services and festivals so we can understand. Remember again that these services in the sanctuary, the festivals in the sanctuary, is a prophetic. It's prophetic. It shows us what God has done now here, what he's done here on this earth, but he's also showing us what he's going to do in the future. And we see these festivals also for the children of Israel were prophecies to point out what the Messiah, what his ministry was here on this earth and also in heaven. Now look at the seven feasts. There are seven feasts, seven main feasts that's associated with the sanctuary. First we have the Passover. We study that. Is that. Has that been fulfilled? Yes or no? Has that been fulfilled? Yes, that's been fulfilled. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. We study that. That has been fulfilled. The Feast of Fruits, First Fruits. That was a prophecy. That was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, which we're going to be studying today, we'll find out also that was fulfilled. And next time we study, next week, we have the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement. All the feasts here, all six feasts were fulfilled except the last one, the Feast of Tabernacles. So we'll be looking through the seven feasts again. We're going to be going through all the seven feasts, rather. So let's go ahead and review the feast that we've been through so far. So, so far we've been through the what? The f what was the feast we've, we've studied so far? Passover. What's another feast we studied? Feast of Unleavened Bread and 
Feast of first fruits. All right, good. So let's review real quick. Just real quick. Don't have a lot of time to review. But we understand the fast Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The type. Remember, I'm talking about the type. That's the actual service itself. And then you had the anti-type, the fulfillment, the symbolic fulfillment of that service. So you had type, anti-type. Now we understood the type, the Passover. That commemorated the children of Israel when they had to leave Egypt. Now had to leave. God delivered them from Egypt. He delivered from Egypt. They had to have to eat the Passover land. We know that was on Abib or Nisan, as known as either one. On the 14th in Abib, they had to eat the Passover lamb, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs. Again, the commemoration of the delivery from Egypt. That was the 14th. And then on the next day, the 15th, that was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that also was a ceremonial Sabbath or a holy day. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread lasts how many days? Seven days. On that seventh day, they also had another feast. They also had a, a ceremonial Sabbath. That was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So again, the Passover was the 14th of Abib. And the next day, the 15th was Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then that's for seven days. And then we know the Passover, the 14th. Then the 15th was what? Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the 16th was what? Feast of First Fruits. For they all came consecutively. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the Feast of First Fruits. We understand that, right? But we know that Feast of Unleavened Bread went for seven days. So it overlapped the Feast of Old First Fruits. The Feast of Old First Fruits, again, the 16th day of Abib. And it basically celebrated the barley grain sheave was waved before the priest. So it was the beginning of the, the barley harvest. As thanksgiving for God for the harvest. The first fruits pointing to that great harvest. So let's look at the type and the anti-type again. So we know the Passover, of course, represented who? Jesus Christ. His blood, his blood not only forgives you your sins, but it cleanses you from sins. Jesus Christ, he was a Passover lamb. We know that. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, when did Jesus Christ die? He died on the Passover day, right? And then we know the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Feast of Unleavened Bread representing the unleavened, representing no sin. Christ was without sin. Right? Christ without sin. So it pointed to Jesus Christ was crucified on that Friday. The next day was a feast of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It fell on the seventh day Sabbath. Actually, we already know the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a ceremonial Sabbath. When that ceremonial Sabbath fell on the actual Sabbath day, it was known as a what? High Sabbath. And we know Jesus rested in his tomb on that Sabbath. He rested from his work of redemption, just like he rested from his work of creation on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Again, pointing to Jesus who was sinless, the bread of life, right? When we eat from the bread of life, we receive, receive nourishment. But the bread we're eating is the word of God. Then we studied last week, we studied the Feast of First Fruits. Again, they're all in consecutive order. Jesus died on Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. He stays in the tomb. On the Feast of First Fruits, what did Jesus do the, the first day of the week? That third day, he what? He rose again early that first day of the week, in which we call Sunday. The day, the Sunday after Passover, the day after the offering of first, on the day, on the day of offering of first fruits. Now, what was significant that Jesus did on that first, of course he rose, but the Bible calls him the first fruit, right? That he is the first fruits. Now, we know when the, when the priest ra waved a grain, waved a, uh, waved the, the wave offering before the priest, he waved a handful. He didn't just wave one kernel. Now we know Jesus was a first fruit, but he took a handful of people. So Jesus rose a handful of people from the grave, and he took them to heaven, and he waved it before the Lord. We studied that. He waved a, a handful of people before the Lord. The feast of first fruits. It all pointed to that time of what Jesus did here, on what Jesus was, has done for us at the cross. That Jesus is that first fruits. All right. Now, here we go. I wish I could have gave you some more detail, but I hope you got some notes on that. Don't have time to go into detail with that. So now let's get into Pentecost. Everybody loves Pentecost. Matter of fact, some people name their denominations or their movement after Pentecost. They call themselves a Pentecostal movement. But what is a true Pentecostal movement? 
Pentecost is also known as the Feast of Weeks because we're going to find out Pentecost just means 50. 50th. That's all it means. If this word Pentecost, it just means 50th. So we're going to look at Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. That's what we're going to be looking at. Again, that is the one, two, three, fourth feast, right? Now notice again those first three feasts, they're all consecutive, back to back. Feast the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. One, two, three. Now, but we notice the Pentecost was 50 days later. That's what we're going to be learning. It was 50 days later. So let's look at a very important feast right here. Very important feast. Now what we're going to look at first, of course, we're going to look at the type. We're going to look at the symbolic part and what they, what they had to actually do. Remember, it was a memorial to continue to point them to Jesus Christ and what he's going to do in the future and now for us what he's going to do now and in the future very soon and we're going to look at the well that's part of the anti-type so we're going to look at the type and then we're going to look at the anti-type the actual fulfillment of it now what is the Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks let's go ahead and learn because a lot of Christians today we hear the word Pentecost and we get stuck in Acts but there's a lot more that goes before Pentecost there's a reason why there's children of Israel or the disciples I should say and the 120 were in the upper room on Pentecost to cost. It was an actual feast. Leviticus chapter 23 starting with verse 15. And notice, and he shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. Now notice what are they doing? They're counting. Now he shall count unto you unto morrow from the morrow after the Sabbath. They're not talking about, they're talking about the ceremonial Sabbath feast of unleavened bread. Remember, the feast of unleavened bread was a ceremonial Sabbath. Okay? But when it fell on the holy Sabbath, it was a high Sabbath. So that's what it's talking about. So tomorrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the way the sheave of wave offering, that's the actual Feast of first fruits, when you bring that wave offering, seven Sabbaths, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So from that time, so literally on the feast of first fruits, counting that's day one, when you, from that day you're going to count how many Sabbaths? Seven Sabbaths. Seven Sabbaths. Very important. Even to the even to the morrow after the seven Sabbath, ye number how many days? Ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So after that feast, once that feast of first fruits fall, you start counting, and then on that fiftieth day, you have a new meat offering, which is basically a grain offering, a meal offering, just like you did first the feast of first fruits. Because it's going to be a commemoration of another harvest. Alright? So, because we know the Feast of Unleavened, the Feast of First Fruits was a commemoration of the barley harvest. But then we're going to find out the Feast, the Pentecost was a commemoration of the wheat harvest. Alright? But anyway, so they're counting 50 days. That's why it's called Pentecost. 50th day. In the Greek, it means 50th day. Everybody got that? That's all it means. 50th day. Pentecost. They call it Feast of Weeks because they started counting the weeks. They count the, 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 the Sabbaths. That's why they call it Feast of Weeks. So everybody in their mind already knows they're starting to count. That's Sabbath number one, Sabbath number two, Sabbath number three, et cetera, et cetera. You have seven Sabbath in the, in the 50th day. All right, we got that. So let's go ahead and look at, let's go ahead and look at verse 17. What they actually did on Pentecost itself, the type. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves and two tenths dill. They shall be of fine flour and they shall bacon, bacon with leavened bread. Interesting. And they are first fruits unto the Lord. And they shall offer the bread seven lambs without blemish the first year and one young bullock and two rams and shall be for burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and their drink offering, even an offering made by fire and sweet savor unto the Lord. Then they shall sacrifice one kid of goats for the sin offering, two lambs of the first year for the sacrifice for the peace offering. And the priest shall wave the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs and they shall be holy unto the Lord. So this day they doing a lot of different sacrifices and he waving the bread and this leaven, not leaven meaning representing sin, but this leaven meaning fullness now. Because we know what leaven does. It does what to bread? It rises the bread. 
And you're bringing this, 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 this bread, this wheat bread, and the lamb. You're waving it now before the Lord. Just like you did the Feast of First Fruits, you just waved the, the grain before the Lord. Now you're waving the lamb. You're waving this, this leavened bread before the Lord. It was more like a celebration. And then, verse 21, and, they, and ye shall proclaim on that same self day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servitile work therein, and it shall be a statue forever in your dwellings and throughout your generations. All right, so let's look at this again. Let's just review a little bit to so get in your mind. So let's look at some, some key points here. The Feast of Weeks. So we know the start, when do you start counting? When do you start counting? The Feast of First Fruits, right? You start counting there. And after, after seven holy weekly Sabbaths, we know it's after seven holy weekly Sabbaths, on the 50th day from the Feast of the First Fruits, that's when it is, Pentecost means what? 50th day in the Greek. So remember that. When anybody's talking about Pentecost, you know in your mind it means 50th day. I can guarantee you, you can ask about 90... You can ask many Christians today, about 90% of the people, probably more, who have no idea what Pentecost means. Have no idea what the word Pentecost means. We just think of the Pentecost, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's the day he outpoured. It was, it was a fulfillment, and we're going to see that in a little bit. And also the duration was one day. It's just one day. The celebration was one day. All right. Pentecost required. Let's look at the required. So this is the type again. So this is the reason why we know we don't have to actually commemorate, actually do Pentecost because you got to kill some lambs. But right now we're living in the anti-type. We're no longer living in the type. You had to wave two loaves of baked bread with leaven before the Lord. Then you had burnt offering. You had a burnt offering with bread. You had a burnt offering, a sin offering, a peace offering, and a wave offering. Now, we talked about those before. Wave offering is like a meal offering. We talked about the different offerings, and that's what they did. They had the burnt offering, which is a general, basically, it, it, it was their thanksgiving to God for the general sins, but the sin offering was the specific sins. And then you had the peace offering, and then a the wave offering. So these were the required offerings in Pentecost. It was a little bit more than what happened in the Feast of First Fruits and in the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. A little bit more going on. But you notice all the different feasts, all the different offerings that were offered during the Pentecost. As we mentioned before, it was a ceremonial Sabbath. There's also a ceremonial Sabbath, a holy convocation. A holiday, so to speak, where they didn't do any work. Now, who was required to gather for the days of Pentecost? Now, notice, and we're going to read some texts in a little bit to prove it, but all the males of Israel, which included their families, you know, except those, I guess, who, who couldn't travel, of course, pregnant women or whatever, but all the males of Israel, they were required to gather together in Jerusalem, a place that God has chosen, and that place was Jerusalem. When they all settled in the land of Canaan, Jerusalem was their headquarters, so to speak, and all the people, didn't matter where they lived, everybody had to come gather at the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, especially the males. And usually they brought their families with them if they were able to travel. This was a requirement. This was a requirement. Matter of fact, there was three feasts, three celebrations where all the males had to come together. And this was one of them. So let's look at some text real quick. Let's look at some text, Deuteronomy 16, 6, some proof text to show us this. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in a place which he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so Feast of Unleavened Bread, we know they got to come and meet. Then we also see the Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks, also known as what? Pentecost, right? Remember the reason why they call it Feast of Weeks? Because they're counting at seven weeks, seven Sabbaths. That's why they call it Feast of Weeks on that 50th day. And then the Feast of Tabernacles. So now you know, three main feasts where everybody from all, it doesn't matter where you are. It don't matter if you moved to, say for instance, you, you live in the United States of America. You had to go all the way, if we were back then, you lived across seas, you had to go all the way back to Jerusalem for this feast. Didn't care what country you lived in. You had to go all, I don't care what language you spoke. You probably don't even speak Hebrew, but you're a Jew. You had to drive all, go all the way back to Jerusalem for these feasts. These three feasts. Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Interesting, because you come to Feast of Unleavened Bread, you got to come back in 50 days. 
<laughs> unless you're going to stay in the town for 50 days, you got to come back. So if you live way, you live two, three hundred miles away, you know, two, three hundred miles is a lot back then, you know, because we got cars now, but back then, that's a good trip, <laughs> Tri trip to walk. You better start, you better just, you better be planning to stay for a while, or you walk on back and walk back 50 days. Anyway, then he said, they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So now obviously you got to bring something with you. Bring something with you when you come to the, to the various feasts. Here's another proof text here, Exodus 23, 14 through 17. Three times shalt thou keep a feast unto the Lord. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread, and thou shalt eat the unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee. The time appointed the month of Abib, for in it thou cometh out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. The feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, and thy house... Thou hast sown in the fields, and the feast of the end gathering, which is the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors in the field. Three times a year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord. All right, you got it. That's in proof text. I didn't just make it up myself. Those are proof texts. The Lord had me three times a year. Now, what did Pentecost commemorate each year? What was the point? What did it commemorate in this type? What was, what was the commemoration? So they counted 50 days, but what was the Lord had in commemorate? Now we know the face of first fruits, that was the beginning of the har barley harvest. But we notice something here. Let's look at Exodus 34, 22. Exodus 34, 22. And it says, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of what? What's the first fruits of this time? The wheat harvest. Very important. The first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. So we see here the feast of weeks was a celebration or commemoration of the wheat harvest. Of the wheat harvest. So again, remember again, the Pentecost, just keep this in mind, I'll have it on the screen here, but Pentecost was a mark of the end of the spring barley harvest. Now remember, when was the beginning of the spring barley harvest? It was a feast of first fruits. And now, when Pentecost, the 50th day, it marked the end of that barley harvest, but the beginning of the wheat harvest. All right, I got it. So that's the commemoration of the remembering, saying, God, thank you for the barley harvest, and thank you for an abundant wheat harvest that we're about to have. So what they had to do is bring that even before the Lord. They made bread from that wheat and brought it before the Lord. Pentecost was a special thanksgiving of that bountiful harvest. And we know that harvest is a what? It's a gathering. It's a, it's a collection. A gathering of his fruit. Right? A gathering of his grain. For what? For consumption. That was the whole point of it. For consumption. For the, to eat. To survive. Another proof text here, Deuteronomy 16, 9, seven weeks shall thou number unto thee, begin with the number of seven weeks, from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. That means in original Hebrew, it means the stalk of the wheat grain. They took the sickle and cut the stalk of the wheat grain. They used the word corn, meaning a stalk. But it's literally talking about the wheat corn itself. So the beginning of that, they start to harvest that. But once they, har once they actually they get the first fruits before they even harvested the wheat corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks. Pentecost was a mark of the end of the spring barley harvest, as I mentioned before, and the beginning of the wheat harvest. Now, what is the greatest need for an abundant harvest, though? Now, we understand we, we, we're going through the, the type already. We, we're, we're catching that already. Now, what is the greatest need for an abundant harvest? An abundant harvest. What is it? What is it? Is it nutrients? Nutrients is good, right? Nutrients in the soil, that's great. Is it a seed? Yeah, you got to have a seed. But the greatest thing is you got it, rain. Now just think about your own body. You're made about 70 to 80% water. If you had no water, you'd be one up, tried up human being. You would not exist. And God is clearly revealing here, in order to have an abundant harvest, you must have what? Rain. And not only you must have rain, you must have the former rain and the what? Latter rain. And any, any farmer knows, that I'm learning as a farmer, any farmer knows when you plant the seed in the ground, if you have no water to the seed, will you have a plant? That seed will not be able to germinate. That seed will still stay dormant. That seed will not germinate until water hits it. So that's known as the first rain or the former rain. You got to have water. But then every good farmer knows if you have an abundant, abundant harvest, you must have the latter rain. 
After that plant has grown and mature, but then you have an extra, extra rain, a nice little downpour on that to give it that extra boost to get it ready for the harvest. So that's the former and the latter rain. So let, so just remember that, the two rains, they're very, very important. The early rain is that downpour to, 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 to give to get that seed ready and germinated. And that latter rain is that extra boost after the plant has grown and matured. Notice that. After the plant has what? Grown and mature. I want you to make that spiritual connection now. Grown and mature. Don't you know we're getting ready for a harvest? And God is preparing a people. And you must be prepared and you must grow now to receive the latter rain. Did you know that? And that latter rain we've been looking at later on is nothing but the Holy Spirit. So in order to receive the outpouring of the Holy Rain, we must be preparing now and growing from that little seed and growing to a mature plant and then God will pour out his latter rain upon you. But you got to mature. You got to mature. So let's go ahead and, and look at some things here. Now, Let's look at what God told Israel. What did God instruct Israel to do in order to receive the early and latter rain? Now let's look at some principles here. We're going to learn something right here. Deuteronomy 11, 13, and 15. Let's go ahead and turn there real quick. Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 15. Very, very important. Because it shows us some principles clearly from the word of God. God said, I will bless you, Israel. He's talking about with the physical resources needed. I will bless your barley. barley. I will bless your wheat. I will give you the former and the latter rain that's needed for your crops. But you must do this, he said. And ye shall come, and it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments. Is that what he said? Remember, this is a covenant. This is a promise. In every promise, there's two people involved at least. And God says here, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, what the Lord said he will do? He said that I will give you the rain of your land in due season, the first rain and the what? Latter rain that thou mayest gather in the corn and thy wine and thine oil and I will send grass in thy fields and thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full. So God, in order to get that former rain and latter rain, God asked for what? Obedience. And obedience, and that's keeping his commandments. God said, be obedient, and then I will bless you with abundance. So in other words, do not expect to receive the former and the latter rain in disobedience. Don't expect it as God continues on. He gives us in Leviticus 26. Let's look at that real quick. Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26.